today as we come to the table. Now think about things like World War I, World War II. Think about the, all the persecution. Think about all the things that have happened. Six million Christians killed by the Roman Empire. You know, six million Jews killed by Hitler. He's saying all those things that happened, they pale in comparison to the Great Tribulation. That is actually the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. You will never experience that. First Thessalonians 5, 9 says you've not been appointed to wrath, but you will have tribulation. You will have persecution. And I thank God that we will experience the Great Tribulation. I think some people believe that when they give their life to the Lord, all their troubles go away. But the reality is that's oftentimes when the troubles begin due to the spiritual battle. A life with Christ is a life that dies daily to Christ. In today's message from Pastor Mark, he explains to you the reality that is the faith journey with Jesus. Sometimes people can think that once you surrender your life to the Lord, everything will be blissful and blessed. There are blessings, but there's also hardship. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary, Knoxville. Pastor Mark desires for you to understand that when Scripture says no servant is greater than its master, it's talking about the disciples of Jesus. Jesus endured many trials, and so will you as his disciple. The Bible says that in this world you will be trials, but to take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the first book of Thessalonians chapter 3 with today's edition of Come to the Table. We're looking today at being prepared for tribulation. And as we get into today's passage, remember Paul had planted this new church there in Thessalonica. He had been run out of town after planting it three weeks later by an angry mob. And we talked about Paul, whenever Paul went somewhere, and especially a place that was a hatred for God, as he began to share the gospel, they ran him out of town. And so even today, if you go somewhere where God is greatly hated, you're going to find out there's going to be a mob. There's going to be people opposing you. There's going to be people that rise up against you in certain areas, even in America, that you could go outdoor and share the gospel. In some places, you'd be more received than others. Some places you would share, and you would actually be rejected in a very aggressive way. Well, Paul faced that in his day even more so. They had multiple gods, and they didn't seem to mind them that much, but if somebody came telling them about the true God, Jesus Christ, Satan would stir them because he knew that was their, his only real threat, and you'd have a riot. So Paul gets run out of town. The problem is he'd only been there three weeks, and again, remember the Thessalonians were a baby church, and as Paul was run out of town by the aggression, if you will, of these uh, people that were getting rid of him, at the same time, Paul realized, I'm leaving those that I love behind. They've just given their life to the Lord. And now they're stuck in the middle of that mob. See, I got to leave, but there they are still there. And Paul loved them, and Paul was concerned about them. You try to put yourself in a situation where you go on a mission trip, and you end up planting a church, and you're there three weeks pouring into them, and the nation runs you out, or the city runs you out, or whatever runs you out, and you're thinking, they have no pastor. They had three weeks of teaching. They're there trying to go on their own, and, and what's going to happen? But again, Paul is going to learn, and they learn that the Holy Spirit is a very good pastor when you don't have a person to be there to be that pastor. God is more than able to grow his church. He's more than able to take care of his church. He's more than able to, to nurture and watch over his church. He's good at that. And yes, he uses us. God doesn't need us. God doesn't need me. But God will use me if I'll make myself available. And God will give Calvary Chapel Knoxville a pastor and every other church a pastor because God wants them to have someone there that can speak to them. They can hear verbally. And God wants to speak through them to the people. And God wants to speak through you to those he puts around you as well. But Paul, again, no doubt knowing this already, no doubt trusting God and the Holy Spirit and knowing God's power, he was still worried. He was still concerned about them. How are they doing? What's going on back there since I left? And so we're going to see Paul today begin to encourage them that although they were experiencing persecution and tribulation, that this was to be expected. And he was actually encouraging them with this. And again, while this may not sound like good news or something that would naturally encourage us, note this. 
being warned and prepared that there's going to be tribulation and there's going to be persecution, it gives us a heads up and an expectation of what's coming and it makes it easier when it does come. And we have to realize that. So God was giving them this message. There's going to be trouble. They were already going through tribulation and persecution. And Paul was saying, you're going to continue to go through that. And you're going to go through even more of that. And you know what? I think this is a message we need to hear today at Calvary Chapel, Knoxville. And that every church needs to be hearing right now, not to make us afraid, not to make us concerned, because God will be our grace and our joy. And we'll get more into that as we get into the passage. But here's the reality. The Bible said in the last days, the heat's going to turn up. Now, there's going to be heat even before the last days. In America, we've been very protected. But again, there's going to be places that we're not going to be so protected. And times were not so protected. And America, things are getting worse. Right? Trust me, there's going to be more accusation against the church in the coming days for all kinds of things. There's going to be more pressure on Israel because Israel and the church are the two main targets of Satan. And these things are going to come under pressure from the enemy. He's going to raise that on us and bring that in on us. And we need to be mentally prepared for that. You know, expectations are everything. If you think that everything's going to go great all the time, when something goes bad, that's not good. But if you're anticipating that things are going to go bad, if they go better, then that's great. But if they go like you're anticipating, then you're not so shocked. And so Paul's letting them know, look, you're going to have difficult times, and we are as well. Now, I know again we said we've been protected here, but I do believe, and this is my personal conviction, never saying I know the day or the hour, but it's my personal conviction, we have entered into what Jesus called the time of sorrows in Matthew chapter 24, verse 8. And the reason I believe that is, is because all these things that Jesus talked about, when he talked about, you know, earthquakes and plagues and ethnic against ethnic group rising up and, and, and all kinds of, tra- and violence around the earth and all these things happening, the Bible said those would happen in the last days. Jesus warned us that in Matthew 24. Verse 7, verse 6 and 7, then he gets into verse 8 and says, when you see these things happening, it's the beginning of sorrows. Now, all these things have always happened, have they not? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, you know, different plagues or whatever and, and earthquakes. But we're seeing them all happen now at the same time. And worldwide, you've got violence, nation against nation, you know, ethnos against ethnos, you know, plagues. All these things are happening right now at the same moment. He said, when you see all these things begin to happen all at one time, he said, the beginning of sorrows has begun. And that's why I personally believe we stepped into that. Now you say, that's not very encouraging. Mark, thank you for telling me we're in the beginning of sorrows. You need to understand this. Listen, God will give us the grace that we need to go through these times of sorrows. What it means is we're going to see more death. We're going to see plague. We're going to see wars. We're going to see fighting. We're going to see more violence around the earth. It's going to happen. He warned us it would. But how much better to know it's going to happen and then to know he's in control of it? Because if he's told us it's going to happen, that means he's seen it. That means he's all powerful and he's in control. See, that's where we have rest. Not that these things, Lord, don't let them happen. They're going to happen at his pace and his way. But we need to be prepared and say, okay, I recognize it's going to happen. But Lord, I know that you're the one that has your hand on the throttle. And you're the one that protects me. You are my hiding place, my refuse, like we just sang about. That's what you are to us. And we're going to trust you. So we don't fear it. We recognize it. And we trust God in the midst of it. And God gave them this message 2,000 years ago. He's going to give us the same message today. These are things we're going to have to face. It's just a part of it. And the closer we get to the end, the more Satan is going to turn up the heat, which means it's going to get more and more interesting as we head into the last days. Now, as I said, the last thing I want to do is discourage you, but by understanding what we're facing, I want you to be prepared. I want you to be prepared. Now, also, I want to say this. God will give the grace, and not only the grace to endure, God will give joy in the midst of it. How many of you have joy this morning? Now, some of you may have anxiety. You may have fear. We're going to pray about that in a moment. And we're going to let God's word minister to you in that here in just a moment. But the bottom line is, is joy is something God gives that the believer has that even in our times or our moments of anxiety, we have this underwriting joy inside of us because we know that everything's going to be okay. We know that it's going to be fine. We have to understand like the Thessalonians that God will give us the grace to endure it and the joy in the midst of it. You know, when you're, when you're a parent, you have to take your kid for a shot, right? If you ever experienced that, you're taking your child for a shot. And maybe some of you told him in advance about there was going to be a little bit of a sting. Maybe you didn't tell him the first time. All it took was one time to the doctor to figure out this is not a fun visit. I mean, even my dog knows it. When I get her in the car, she hides in the seat on the other side. She doesn't like to go to the doctor. So we, especially as kids, we know the same thing, right? So we take our kids to the doctor, and there comes a point, at least I, you know, at least I, you know, with, with my kids, I remember with one of them, you know, again, you're going to get a shot. There's going to be a little sting. 
but then we'll get something special after, you know? It's going to be okay. It'll be over with quick and whatever. We have a loving Heavenly Father. And so what he says to us is in the last days, there's going to be a little bit of a sting. And I want you to be prepared for that. Don't be taken by surprise or caught off guard. But you know what? I'm going to get you a big, juicy, eternal ice cream after that. It's all going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. And you know, at the moment of the pain, it seems like the worst thing in the world. Almost the fear of it seems to make it the worst thing. But then again, once you have that peace of the Lord and you realize it wasn't that bad, you get in the kingdom. You know, when I read about the, the, the martyrs that have gone before us, you read their story and their testimonies. And I talk to other people that are, that are in other countries that have gone through things. I realize, you know what? God gives grace when you need grace. It's, for us, it seems very scary. You know, something could happen, but if God calls you to go through something that's hard, God's going to give you grace and God's going to give you joy. And these people, when they're facing these trials, they end up singing to God. And that's not natural. They didn't just say, I'm just determined I'm going to be a good witness. So I'm going to sing to God before they do this or whatever. They're doing it because God is putting joy in their hearts. It's something that God does. And when you live in that situation, you have more grace to abide it. You know, I, we don't have that much persecution here, but again, we will, I think, fur, further on down the road. I remember going to a trip in Vietnam a while back, a few years back, I went to Vietnam. And of course, it's illegal to preach the gospel in Vietnam. We think about persecution and tribulation. We don't face that much of it uh, yet. But at the same time, you go somewhere else, well, there it's illegal. So the church is underground. And you have to go to a little place. I remember I was going there and they kind of have a school of ministry or a school going on where the church comes in, they teach them and they're training up other pastors and leaders and all this. And so I went there and they bring different pastors in at every time. I went there for a week or so to teach through some certain subject or whatever. And they drive you back to this neighborhood and you go to this house and there you are and they, they don't want anybody to know you're there. It has to be kind of this secret thing. So you're in this house and I'm thinking, well, we're in here singing. You know, they said the walls are thick and you're kind of up on the second level and they've been doing it for years there and they're safe or whatever. And from time to time, they have to be extra cautious. Well, one of the days we were there, all of a sudden, they get real quiet and they say, be quiet, somebody called the police. I think, great. I go one trip into an area where you get arrested for it, and I'll live the rest of my life in Vietnam. There's a man of faith for you, right? But you know, just for a moment, I'm like, great, my great timing, huh? You know? But then I just went, wait a minute, God's in control of this, and just wait and see what God does, and this whole thing, keep it quiet, and then after a while, they, they say, look, when they leave, we're going to sneak you out down this way and get you in a car. And sure, it's like some detective show, you know, I need like my own theme song or something, you know, it gets quiet, I don't want to make it more than it is, but you're standing there in the house, everybody's being quiet, all of a sudden, the TNS hall puts you in the back of a car and you drive off, and you're thinking, okay, good, we got out of there, but now I got out of there, but what about those guys? What about those guys? I just left. I'm an American. They probably wouldn't put me in jail. They probably would say you have to leave the country. That'd probably be my worst consequence. Hey, you're not supposed to be here preaching the gospel. Get out of here, right? But like Paul, my heart would have been, but what about them? And I think about, what about those guys? They're doing this every week, multiple times a day, illegally in their home. And, and in any moment, they could be arrested and put in jail. And some of them are. And I'm thinking, Paul's probably going the same. Look, look I, I got run out of town. I can leave. But the people I love, they love the Lord. They're back there going through this. They're facing the persecution. We have a different world that we face here than other people face. And we have to recognize that we also, we have to have a heart for them going through this uh, persecution and tribulation. But again, I believe we're going to start experiencing more of that in America because of the environment that we're seeing. And we need to be prepared. Now, I want you to notice also, I said that Paul told them and will tell them today they will face tribulation. But that is not the great tribulation. There's a big difference between earthly tribulation that Paul's talking about and the great tribulation that the Bible talks about. The great tribulation is a specific time in history that the Bible declares is the worst time on planet earth. It says those three and a half years will be worse than any other time that the earth has ever experienced in its history. Now think about some of the times that the earth has experienced. You talk about pandemic in 1918, the Spanish flu killed 40 million people. 40 million people died. From the Spanish flu. Compare that to today. It's really nothing compared. I'm not belittling what we're going through. I'm saying compared to what they went through in 1918. Now think about things like World War I, World War II. Think about the, all the persecution. Think about all the things that have happened. Six million Christians killed by the Roman Empire. You know, six million Jews killed by Hitler. He's saying all those things that happened, they pale in comparison to the Great Tribulation. That is actually the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. You will never experience that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says you've not been appointed to wrath, but you will have tribulation. You will have persecution. And I thank God that we won't experience the Great Tribulation. I think some people believe that when they give their life to the Lord, all their troubles go away. But the reality is that's oftentimes when the troubles begin due to the spiritual battle. The good news is we have the Holy Spirit to help us. We have the joy of the Lord to see us through it. And that'll be Paul's approach today when he gets into this passage here in 1 Thessalonians. Okay, let's jump in. Long enough intro there. Look what he says in verse 1. Paul says, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, 
we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. Now notice Paul says Timothy was a minister and fellow laborer in the ministry. This was huge to Paul. The, the word minister here means diakonos. It's where we get the word deacon, which really means servant or one who serves. And not only does he say he was a servant, he says he labored with me. He did the work of me. He got down there and got his hands dirty. He worked hard. He traveled. He spent late hours ministering to the flock. He poured his life out. He prayed with me. He taught with me alongside all these things. And he said, I need him because, you know, you're not the only one that's going through persecution. I'm going through persecution as well. But he says, you know what? Your need is greater than mine, so I'm going to send Timothy. I sent Timothy to you because of that. Again, the parent is going to be more concerned about the child. And Paul and Silas and Timothy, they were older in the Lord. These were babies in the Lord. He says, you need some help. I'm going to send Timothy. I sure could use him here. He labors with me. He's a servant, but I love you guys, and, and he, your need is greater, so I want to do that because I'm uncertain about you. I'm uncertain about how you're doing. I didn't know how you were doing, and he even says here, notice I couldn't endure it anymore. It's like I was so worried about you. I got snuck out because the police showed up, you might say, or run out of town or whatever the case might be, and you're left there in the middle of it. And I don't know what's happened, and I have no way to text you and call you. It doesn't work that way anymore. And so I'm sending someone back to say, go see if they're okay. Go teach them some more. Go spend time with them. Bring back message to me what's been happening. So it's better that we're alone than you are alone. And it's interesting that Paul says here that they were no longer wanted to be uncertain. He says, you know, we want to know how you're doing there, and which shows their uncertainty, if you will. It's interesting. The word Athens here literally means uncertain. Isn't that interesting? And by the way, for those of you who really study the Bible more than just reading it, you want to look up words and all this, look up the names and the meanings of these places that are mentioned in the passage you're studying. Look them up. The names give you further insight by the Holy Spirit. The names of the towns and the people. And God does that on purpose to give us further insight. And it's almost as if he's saying, look, even the town that Paul was in, I made him feel uncertain. And I put that in Paul's heart so he would send Timothy back to go and check on them and make sure they're doing okay. And notice why he sent Timothy back, not just to, again, check on them, but he says here specifically to establish them and encourage them in the Lord. I love this. These two elements of establishment and encouragement, what every believer needs and what we need here in Knoxville. We need to be established, guys, for the days we're facing and the times we're heading into, we need to be established and we need to be encouraged for what's coming. Established here, again, because they were only there for three weeks since the church had been planted. It's hard to establish something in a short time like that. And encouraging them because they had a lot of opposition and persecution in Thessalonica. Again, established here literally means to make stand, not make a stand, but to make stand, to make something stand, firm if you will, and to stabilize it. So it's not tottered and blown back and forth by the winds of opposition, the winds of persecution, the winds of tribulation. He says, I want you to be strong so that when the wind comes, you're going to make it. You're going to stand there. You're not going to fall over. And so you need that in place to be established. And encourage your means to call oneself to and to comfort. And so Paul says, what I was doing was I was sending Timothy there to stabilize you, to help you stand. You ever seen somebody that's a little bit wobbly, you know, maybe a little kid, they're a little bit wobbly, and you kind of grab their hand, or you stabilize them? He says, I'm sending Timothy to grab your hand to stabilize you. I'm sending him to make sure that you don't get knocked down in all this persecution that happens. You have to be stabilized, but I'm also sending him there to comfort you in your distress. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's just like you do with a kid. You stabilize them, you know, they're scared, they get afraid, oh, they grab your leg, get behind you, you put your hand on them. It's going to be okay, sweetie. It's going to be okay. That's just the pastor. <laughs> but we comfort our kids, right? We comfort them, and we, we, we hold them stable, and we make sure they're okay. He says, that's my heart for you, Thessalonians, and that's God's heart for you guys. That's his heart. He sees them. If you're shaky right now, God sees it. He sees that you're a little bit wavering. What's going on? What's going to happen? What's, what's, what's happening in the world? Where are we? He's like, okay, calm down. Calm down. I'm your father. And I'm, I'm in control of everything. And I can stabilize you. And I can stabilize the world. And I'm going to hold you so that you're not only stabilized, I'm going to comfort you with my spirit and my grace and my peace. It's beautiful. And that's Paul's heart. I love the word he used here for established because it's the exact same word, again, here in the Greek, but then in the Hebrew, exact same word translated in Exodus 17 when it talks about Aaron and her, and they were battling the Amalekites. Remember, he sent Joshua out to battle the Amalekites, and it said that Moses put his hands up, but Moses got tired. That's the Hebrew prayer position. 
It's a picture of Moses praying. And while Moses was there on the mountain praying over the battle, Joshua was defeating, and the men, the children of Israel, were defeating the Amalekites. And it says as he got tired, you hold his arms up there. He got for a long time, for hours, he began to get tired, and his arms would come down. And every time his arms came down, you'd see the enemy, the Amalekites, start winning. And it's a beautiful picture of how important prayer is if we're going to win the spiritual battle. We have to maintain through prayer so that we have victory over the enemy. But then Moses and her, or rather Aaron and her, saw that. And they said, wait a minute, his, his arms are going down. Every time his arms goes down, we lose. Let's help him. And her got on one side, Aaron got on the other side. They held up the arms of Moses. And while they held up the arms of Moses, they had the victory over the Amalekites. And what Paul is saying is, I've sent Timothy to hold up your arms. He's there to establish you. He's there so you can pray through this. He's there so that you'll endure and you'll make it and give you the victory over the enemy that you need to have. And that's what we need to be for each other. That's what I need to be for you, praying for you. That's what you need to be for me, praying for me. Listen, I sit in a very privileged position because, again, when there's a focused prayer for Calvary Chapel, a lot of you guys pray for me because it's hard to think about everybody in the church and pray for everybody. You've got your people you pray about, but I'm sure a lot of you are praying for me, whether I ask for it or not. And I love that. People come up to me all the time and say, I'm praying for you, and I believe you. See, when the world says it, you watch the news and somebody, there's uh, something bad happens, they say, well, are, are we sending our thoughts and prayers your way? And I always wonder, Really? Is that just a religious thing to say because it fits in or did you, are you praying for them? When you guys say to me, Mark, I'm praying for you, I love it. I got a couple of those yesterday and I'm not asking you to come up and do it today. He's like, y'all better go and tell him. I'm praying for you. <laughs> but you know what? It's like, Lord, that's really pretty cool. People are praying for me. How encouraging is that? And Paul says, I, I've sent Timothy there to pray for you, to establish you, to hold up your arms, to let you know you're not alone. You're not alone. It's not just God with you, which is enough, but we're with you as well. And you need to know that not only is God with you, which is all you need, by the way, that's all you need, but I'm with you. And all these people sitting around are with you. We're with the family of God. We're one family and we love each other. And so he says, I, 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 you need to be established and I'm establishing you. And then he goes on there in verse three, notice this, it says that no one should be shaken by these afflictions for you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. Now, a couple of words I wanna point out, shaken and appointed. <laughs> this is a wonderful and terrible verse, but really it's good and I'll explain. It's encouraging and challenging. First of all, why is it, again, encouraging? It will be once I give you the full explanation here. He says he doesn't want them to be shaken by the persecution that's happening to them. And then he says they need to remember it was something they've been appointed to. And by knowing it's something that God ordained, you, you say, all right, I may not like it, but I know God's in control of it. Now, let's give a little bit more definition here. Notice Paul, when he said he knew there were young believers, they were, gonna, they were in opposition being shaken. This is an interesting word. The, the word shaken here literally means to wag the tail of a dog. It's a dog wagging its tail. That's what this word is. Now, when I thought about that, I thought, well, that's not so scary. I kind of like that. You know, I like seeing them wag their tail, but that's not what he's saying. He said, yeah, maybe something when you see a dog wagging its tail and that looks happy, but if you were some tiny creature holding onto that dog's tail, that wouldn't be a happy moment. Watch how fast it goes. Watch how long it goes. Watch how often throughout the day it goes. Think about that as persecution. You've just heard Pastor Mark Kirk teaching from the book of 1 Thessalonians here on Come to the Table. In his letter to the Christians in Thessalonica, the Apostle Paul comforts them by teaching them about the resurrection hope that believers have in Jesus. For Christians, death is not the end. Just as Jesus died and rose again, we too will be raised to be with Jesus for all eternity. That's why no matter what happens to us, we can have an unshakable hope for the future. If you want to have this kind of hope, all you have to do is place your trust in Jesus. If you have questions about what that means, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call at 865-609-1385. Once again, that's 865-609-1385. In addition, you can let us know by using our questions or comments link found on our website, thewaymedia.net. While you're there, Stay a while. Familiarize yourself with our ministry and what we're about. Come to the Table is a ministry based out of Calvary, Knoxville. If you find yourself traveling through, staying in, or residing in Knoxville, Tennessee, we hope you'll come check us out at Calvary, Knoxville. Consider that an invitation from us to you. We'd love to have you join our community. Service times can be found at thewaymedia.net. 
Just scroll down and find the link to Calvary Knoxville. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. But we want to thank you for listening. Pastor Mark has more valuable insights from the first book of Thessalonians. So join us again on the next edition of Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary, Knoxville.